But it's my pleasure to introduce this really important topic um, for our lunchtime discussion today, leading through the pandemic, lessons from school leaders. And we have an incredible panel here to talk about this process with us. So first, I want to introduce Dr. Sean, Sean Nelms, William and Sheila Konar, Director of the Center for Urban Education Success, Superintendent of East High EPO, Associate Professor at the Warner School. And if he doesn't do enough, he actually agreed to fill in and the Associate Dean role for graduate studies for me while I've been gone. So Sean and I have been working really closely together with him in that role, and I'm very appreciative of his help. So I wanna tell you a little bit about Sean. He's superintendent of East Upper and Lower Schools, formerly East High School in Rochester, New York, a new position created through the unique partnership between the New York State Education Department, Rochester City School District, and University of Rochester. As the Educational Partnership Organization EPO Superintendent for East, Nelms has been charged with creating a school reform model that can be replicated in urban settings throughout the US. In 2018, he was named the first William and Sheila Konar Director for the Center for Urban Education Success, known as CUES, at the Warner School. In this role, Nelms leads the center's efforts to support the success of K-12 urban schools, both locally and nationally, through a combination of research, relationship building, and a commitment to pursue and share best practices. Prior to his superintendency, Nelms served as Chief of Schools for the Rochester City School District, where he supervised the Northeast Zone and successfully led impl implementation of the New York State Regents Reform Initiative. His focus on professional development for principals and teachers led to improvements in leadership capacity, instructional delivery, and student achievement. Nelms also worked as a principal in the Rush Henrietta School District and as an assistant principal and social studies teacher in the Greece School District. And we couldn't be any happier that he's a part of our group. <laughs> Uh, I, I, one of his colleagues is also here, uh, Justin Jennings, EDD, from Youngstown City School District and the Chief Education Officer. Mr. Jennings attended Purdue University on a varsity basketball scholarship. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree. He would go on to earn three master's degrees in educational leadership, special education administration, and special ed with an emphasis in emotional impairments from Grand Valley State. In addition, he received an educational specialist degree in leadership from Grand Valley State University. He is co currently completing the dissertation portion for his doctorate of education degree in educational leadership at the University of Michigan. Mr. Jennings also completed the National Superintendent Certification through the American Association of School Administrators 2020 cohort. He currently serves as Chief Executive Officer of Youngtown City Schools. He travels the country speaking on equity and education and is dedicated to student voice in school systems. He has worked as a teacher and administrator in Grand Rapids Public Schools, serving as assistant principal at Grand Rapids Creston High School and Union High, and as a head principal at Union High School. He served as head principal of Holland High School and New Tech High at Holland High School in Holland, Michigan, an eighth through 12th grade building of 650 students. From 2013 to 15, he worked as the executive principal of a community school, Willow Run Community Schools, and I, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce that, public school consolidation. Before his current role, he served as assistant to superintendent of curriculum and the director of special education for Muskegon Public Schools. Mr. Jennings has probably served as president of Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. He also served as the Michigan Principal Fellowship Coaches Institute, Principals Advisory Council. He's a member of Purdue's President's Council and the Michigan High School Athletic Executive Council, which is the governing body. In 2001, he received the Leadership Award from High School That Works, Making Middle School's Grades Work 2021 Leadership. And then our third panelist, Cito Narcisse, and correct me if I got that wrong, Cito, please, East Baton Rouge Parish School Superintendent. Dr. Cito serves as the superintendent of East Baton Rouge Schools. His most recent work as the chief of secondary schools of the District of Columbia Public Schools. He understands the challenge of being a young student trying to learn English and living between two cultures, all while adapting to the American public education system. The son of Haitian immigrants, Dr. Narcisse moved with his family to Long Island in pursuit of a better life for him and his siblings as an English language learner. Dr. Narcisse learned to navigate both the social and academic obstacles that confront millions of students today. His success as a student led him to enroll at Kennesaw State University in Georgia, 
Seeing his second language as a strength, he graduated with a degree in French and pursued a master's degree from Vanderbilt in secondary ed. Doctoral studies led him to the University of Pittsburgh, where he earned a doctorate in educational administration and policy and leadership. Serving as both a teacher and a principal, he opened a high school in the Pittsburgh public schools and led turnaround efforts in a Boston public high school. He's been director of school performance and acting chief school improvement officer for Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland. An associate superintendent overseeing school improvement efforts for 74 schools in Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland and was the second officer in charge as chief of schools for Metro Nashville Public Schools with 159 schools. So thank you to all three of you for joining us and I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Thanks, thanks, Doug. Um, as you can tell, university, they like language. So that intro took about 15 minutes. <laughs> so we're, gonna, <laughs> we're going to uh, uh, get right into the discussion. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, these lunch talks are, are invaluable. We have, I've learned so much about our university colleagues and um, the work being done um, locally. So I wanted to kind of take this opportunity to reflect on the work around school transformation leadership from a national perspective and wanted to invite two of, of many of, of the folks that I, I consider friends and mentors and colleagues um, and, and, and truth tellers. I mean, they, they don't hold back when things are going <laughs> the wrong. They'll let us know, let each other know. So much so that um, every Friday, there's a group of superintendents uh, from all over the country who, uh, who meet um, by Zoom. Uh, Friday's around five or six o'clock, just to debrief the week. The last two years um, have been tough. It's been tough on school leaders, uh, we were speaking with a colleague this past Friday who has receiving death threats um, from members in, within his community. Wife was threatened at a board meeting. Uh, another colleague um, was uh, of color, was receiving um, uh, racial threats and, and promises to do him harm. Um, and, and Fridays are an opportunity for us to, to let things out and then to refocus and to continue to do the work that we're passionate about. And these are stories of leadership that we often don't hear about because we have to put on the, put the suit on or dress on and put the smiling faces on and, and go out and do the work of the community. But some of the emotional harm and hurt that's done to school leaders are often felt and, and, and dealt with in private. So that gives us a platform to be able to decompress and to think about um, school leadership and leadership principles and design that allow us to add value not just to the P12 space, but to the higher ed uh, community as well. So today it just is going to be um, your opportunity to kind of sit in our Friday meeting um, and to talk about things about leadership. I'm gonna in, in, encourage Justin and, and Cito to be as, as transparent and raw as they like, knowing that this is recorded and your school board will see it at some point, <laughs> so, or may see it at some point. So, uh, you know, share what, you, what you're willing to share. Um, but, but Warner is a community, University of Rochester is a community of transparency and, and we often have the really tough conversations and, and um, unique in different ways, but we're used to being um, raw about these things. So, so you're not gonna hurt anyone's feelings if you call things out. So since this is a university platform, why don't I start with Cito um, first? I'm gonna have you talk a little bit about, I know you've, you've had the introduction, but I wanna hear a little bit about your, your dissertation topic and how, it, how it's informing or has informed your work thus far as a leader. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Sean. Uh, and, and I would say I, we learned from Sean as much too. I know he's been humbled about these things, but uh, but uh, you know, just a great opportunity to connect with colleagues. Uh, you know, the thing that's hard about this job it's very lonely. Uh, and you know, when you're making decisions and doing things and trying to get it right, uh, it's uh, you know you you are always hoping that you have a few critical partners. And so I appreciate uh, Sean for being that and Justin. I know Joe's on here as well. So. Uh, it's just really important to have those critical partners as you uh, go through this tough work. Um, so to tell you a little bit about my dissertation, I did my dissertation on school community partnerships. Uh, a part of that was um, looking at, I did a case study on um, how do school community partnerships impact the work. Um, uh, it's a very boring dissertation, but uh, to give you just the high cliff notes on it was, um, uh, I went to a community in Georgia uh, they had this project called the Georgia Project, where if you ever gone to Georgia, there's a, a town called Dalton, Georgia, which is uh, on the border of Georgia and Tennessee. And they had an influx of PLL learners uh, in a matter of like two to three years from 5% to 300%. And this community 
uh, struggle. Uh, if you know uh, that community, uh, it's known as the carpet capital of the world, has a lot of mills and industry mills. And so uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, families who spoke uh, Spanish speak mostly ELL, mostly Mexican population went there to work in the carpet mills. And what they forgot while they were inviting all these folks to work in the carpet mills were like, these folks are going to bring kids with them. And their schools were going to turn from like all white schools to like, you know, black and Latino schools and, you know, bringing all this culture. And so uh, um, there was a senator that was there whose uh, daughter was a um, Senator Irwin Mitchell. Uh, he's a, a big guy that was at that time whose daughter was a paraprofessional and she goes back and tells her dad uh, that uh, this school needs help and they came up with this thing called the Georgia Project. You can Google it uh, where uh, he influenced, uh, went back to Washington DC and said we need help in our community and they went to help support and I wrote about uh, the different partners, things that went well or didn't go well. But what I, what I learned the most was um, that, you know, the, the work is not sufficient only from a grassroots standpoint, but you need also people at the top to kind of close that gap to be able to move and support a community to move it, especially on tough and challenging issues. And, and uh, they did a pretty good job at that uh, over the years. Um, and so, but it's very fascinating. I think 60 Minutes is something on them as well. But uh, anyway, I went to do that case study. He also learned how college played a part of it. And I even went to uh, Mexico to go to the University of Monterrey where they recruited, uh, um, they were recruiting student teachers from Mexico to come to this town to do student teaching, which was, I thought was fascinating too. So uh, I get to interview their deans and all that stuff. So anyway, make a long story short, that's, that's kind of um, what I wrote about. That was years ago. And, um, what I learned when I became a superintendent <laughs> was uh, uh, doing that on steroids <laughs> is an important thing to do uh, because um, you can't move this work alone. I mean, one thing, um, I've been fortunate, uh, this is my first superintendency, but I've been a number two, three, four, and five of superintendents. And uh, one thing is to be the mechanic and trying to implement things, but when you get to sit in the seat to see how the community plays a part, business partners play a part, uh, you know, nonprofits and all these different things pulling at you to pull off work where you're trying to provide access and opportunity uh, into communities is a very, very challenging thing. And so um, a part of the things that I learned was trying to figure out how to close uh, the gaps, not only ensuring that you have both grassroots um, effort on trying to help partnering in schools, but also how do you keep state officials, business partners, nonprofit groups to be a part of that pull with you in the same direction uh, because there's uh, different entities that bring that to the table as well, um, especially when you're addressing issues that deal around equity and access. And then by the way, put an asterisk on pandemic, right? And so, uh, which is usually people have felt like, well, because we're in a pandemic, we shouldn't really be doing too much, just making children feel safe to come back. And so, uh, and so I, we here have been trying to push not only for trying to get kids to feel safe and come back, but also to do what our job is to do is to try to keep pushing learning at a time where learning is not always the priority, um, but uh, you know, those are kind of all the, the elements. And so um, uh, that's kind of what's influenced me in this work, um, uh, especially around community partnerships and how that works. I, I, there's a, a saying I always tell people here in our, in our city, um, I always say to them, you know, I may be the superintendent, but I'm just the facilitator and coordinator of the village. <laughs> and uh, it takes all of us to kind of help move this ball together in order for success to happen. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, where I am right now in East Baton Rouge, we're the second largest school district in the state of Louisiana. Uh, our district has about 41,200 uh, kids. Uh, we are the, the capital of Louisiana. So we always, uh, the, you know, we're about 59 minutes from New Orleans. <laughs> I tell folks from the airport. Uh, when you fly to New Orleans, if you ever come to Baton Rouge, we're the home of LSU, Southern University, and those other folks, and, and also the home of a pack of politicians uh, that uh, that help uh, that I have in our school system, including uh, large large poor students. We're a council of great city school district, and we have about 85% uh, of our students are poor, uh, black and brown kids, and then 15% uh, white students. And uh, and uh, we we've had we've been the one of the districts that have been the longest running district that have was under desegregation uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, the way for them to integrate 
they use the magnet schools approach to do that. And so uh, just to give you some context of our world down here. And so uh, that's been kind of uh, what we've been pushing. And, uh, and, I, and when I came here from Washington, D.C., I remember uh, flying in uh, to, to uh, meet the students and come for the, the job on the first day under COVID. It was full school going on here <laughs> while the rest of the country was in lockdown mode. And so uh, I can remember uh, my, telling my wife, you know, we had to negotiate how I was quarantining every time I went back because I had to fly back and forth. And, uh, you know, you go from D.C. where it's, you know, everybody was under lockdown and you come to Louisiana where everybody was, you know, school is going on today with uh, masks on. So uh, uh, it was a very interesting cultural di di dichotomy. But, uh, but you know, we've been uh, pushing along. And so um, uh, that's that's kind of where we are. Thank you. And if, if, if you ever are interested in, in, in going on to see those LinkedIn, you'll see that the community engagement piece is uh, critically important and essential to him. He is. Um, constantly speaking with and to the community in ways that are that's informative, but it's also listening. In fact, I believe he was featured in a in a pretty prominent uh, uh, um, publication this past uh, month or so, um, speaking about his work in the community. And and so I appreciate you for sharing that. We'll get into some of the community's um, aspects of leadership as well um, after Justin goes. So Justin. Uh, okay, so my, my role is a little different from a superintendent. My, my title is actually the CEO. So in Ohio, I am I am the superintendent without a school board is the best way to describe it to, to kind of put it in perspective. Um, I, I actually work for the, the, the um, state education, the state education and the governor. So my district is a takeover district. We were the lowest achieving district for about 10 years and the state took over. So for the last six years, they, they've had a, a CEO, which is me and we're transitioned in June to back to the school board ownership and the superintendent. Uh, my, my, uh, I always, I always give this prerequisite. My, uh, first of all, my dissertation is not done. And I started my dissertation about four years ago. So when I started my dissertation, the critical race theory was not as controversial as it is now. So the topic of my dissertation is, is the uh, lack of longevity for African American male, uh, African American and male superintendents. It, it, and it, it pertains to the critical race theory. And, and we talk about how the critical race theory is, is what we the, what we feel is, is a social construct. It's not something that, that every, everybody understands. So it, it's really been very interesting to, I think that every all the soups are on it. You understand when you go to a board meeting, you never know what's gonna happen. I've had plenty of board meetings where people that came up and the first question they have is, are you teaching the critical race theory in school? And I have to explain to them that, that no, it's not something that you teach and you have to kind of explain to them, you know, what it is. And then they go back, well, I read it with something different and without actually doing the research. So my, my research is a little different. The first thing I learned from my, my, my studies is there's not a lot of studies on African-American male superintendents. So that, that's the first thing. So my uh, going back to what uh, Dr. Nelm said, my Friday group is, is kind of like an incubator for my dissertation because I really get insight that, that I never that I hadn't gotten before. So it has been really interesting to listen to the different stories. And even more than that, and kind of getting into the topic, it's, it's been therapy for me because as we go and we, we talk about the pandemic, one of the things that I, I focus on in my district is self-care. What, what are you doing for yourself? you know, really through this pandemic, because we're not through the pandemic. And I think some people now, just like me, I, I was telling somebody this morning, man, I'm so sick of wearing a mask. I'm, I'm tired of wearing a mask. I don't even want to fly on an airplane because if I'm on an airplane longer than two hours, I'm, I'm in a mask. And, and, and you know, in and, and some points, it, it begins to create trauma. And we have to think about what that looks like for our teachers every day. We have to think about what that looks like for our scholars every day, because they, they're in this traumatic experience as well. So... Yeah, 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 absolutely. I agree with Stacy in the chat. She says, get that dissertation done <laughs> so we can, we can read it in, in real soon. And you're absolutely right. There's not a lot that goes on. And we talk about in our, in our meetings sometimes that um, many people of color, particularly leaders of color, come from marginalized communities and some communities that are under-resourced. And so we're naturally drawn to the most challenging spaces, which means our life expectancy is really short. Um, you know, we are in and out of positions every two or three years. When I often watch some of our colleagues being very comfortable communities and, and there for a long time. In fact, um, we often tell some of our friends who are in um, high performing districts, don't leave, <laughs> like do the work there and, um, and, 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 and be that voice for those students in that community uh, also. And that's, and that's, it has a lot to do with leadership. So we're drawn to so leadership. Sometimes you're drawn to the fire and you want to lead in that fire and, and you find great, um, you, you, you find great spiritual well-being by leading 
chaos into something that's more stable. In your, in your role, Justin, you are doing school transformation work. What has been some of your biggest challenges um, during the pandemic in trying to maintain this critical work um, that of course is being watched closely by um, your state education department and, and, and other local leaders? Well, I think part of it is people have to understand we're one of the few industries in which the government pretty much determines the, the direction that we go. I mean, state testing, different things, uh, the accountability, it, it's all its all really legislated, at least here in Ohio, it's all really legislated. So, so that's really a tough part. But when I think about lessons learned or, or just the expectation, it, it's the same thing with, with the situation that we're in. We, we have to maintain a high level of expectation for our scholars in front of our students. And that's one of the things that we, we have to make sure that we can t continue to push our teachers and continue to push our administrators to make sure we, we maintain those high standards. I mean, make no mistake, if you if you look up, you know, Youngstown, uh, Youngstown uh, City Schools, you're, you're gonna see low test scores. And a lot of that, it's been it's been years and years, 20 years of failure. And now it's, it's bringing people in and, and maintaining those who we have to make sure that they have high standards. Our average uh, teacher in our district has been here for 18 years. So if you think about 20 years of failure, 18 years, it, it's really about changing the mindset of those people who are there. And, and for all the superintendents, I know you'll shake your head at this. It's not easy to find teachers right now. It, just like a bus driver, there, it's not easy to find them. So really, we have to we have to deal with the ones we have, and we have to make sure that, that they have the confidence, but they also have high expectations when they walk in that classroom every day. But at the same time, a lot of our teachers are suffering from fatigue. I mean, we, we've been going on and on through, through the pandemic. Um, we, we were one of the few schools where last year we pretty much, we didn't go back to school until the end of the year. We, we stayed remote pretty much the whole time. And we did that more for the, the health and well-being of, of, our, of our staff and of our students as well. And we also, every day, we, we make sure when we make the decision to mask, we make sure we do that. It's not a political decision. It's, it's a decision that's best for people. And it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, if, if it's best to wear a mask, that's, the, that's what we have to stand on. And, and even as superintendents, sometimes it's not a decision that we should be making, but we're forced to make that decision. And then we become either a hero in the community or we become hated in the community. So it's, it's a tough situation to be in as, as a superintendent in this role. That's great, that's great. Uh, Cito, so, so you're leaving um, DC, you're headed to Louisiana, and, and I know that state. I mean, historically, particularly after Katrina, um, they've gone through a number of school type reforms. You mentioned magnet schools; they went charter. A lot of the population moved, and now they're coming back. From looking at some of the uh, national data around um, patterns moving back into into that area, I mean, coming in as a leader, and I, I tell people that superintendents are leaders in a school context. They're not just school leaders. And so, because our role as superintendents expand well beyond the classroom, it's working with politicians, those at the state level, local businesses, um, dealing with the individuals who, um, no matter what we do, are gonna dislike our decisions and, and be vocal about that, but also those who follow blindly. And we have to navigate all those complexities um, daily and keep the momentum moving forward. So as you transition from you know, Boston, you knew New York. I met you years ago when you were a fellow at, at Harvard. I mean, you were talking like 20 years ago, by the way, Marcelo. Um, we were <laughs> young in the game. Um, you have been in a lot of different spaces and now you get to take all those leadership lessons and impact a, a, a local school district. What have you done to transition um, in ways that allow you to be successful, but more importantly, that allows your team to be successful? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I ended up moving, I I moved because of opportunity, you know. Um, what I undervalued was, you know, every place that you move, you tend to learn about the community, how people think, how they approach things, you know, how, how different classes work, you know, how different cultures work, you know, how people in different spaces work. And, uh, and then there's also the component between moving from the north to the south, right? There's a whole cultural shift in that. And uh, what ended up happening, whether it was uh, intentional or unintentional, I'd probably say more unintentional was I got to learn more about people than about anything else. And that kind of gave me a, a very different context when I would come into work in schools, because uh, I've always been the position I had in school systems before I became the superintendent. I was the, always the implementer, right? So the super would say, you know, I got this idea, we need to implement X. And so I had strategizing on implementation with the, with the district. And so, uh, and what, what I, what got me in all of these, um, in every district I've been in and transitioning is that context matters. 
Um, and what matters the most in the context is to quickly figure out historically what the context of the district is, or historically the context of the people that you serve, uh, whether it's that's culturally, race, whatever the categories are in there. And then also understand is what that community defines as success or not. And you got to do that as quickly as possible. And, um, and then the other part I've learned is uh, trying to also assess the people in the community. You know, the, the higher you move up in central office, the more you get exposed to things. And uh, what I learned was the higher I got up the food chain or the opportunity chain, the more I started seeing education in a very different light because I got to start seeing like, I was like, oh my God, this is how this thing really works. Well, I really want to do this. You know, when I was the number two in the right hand of the superintendent, I'm dealing with the board and watching how we manage politics and which group is influencing what and all this stuff. I saw education in a very different place versus when I was a little bit lower in the organization. I was just worried about schools, right? Or, you know, which principal and all. And I did not know that all those things impact what's the right thing to do for kids and all those components. And so there's this whole savviness that you have to have as quickly as possible to kind of determine your analysis gap and then quickly have a strategy that you can move forward. And more importantly, try to bring people along, right? Because no matter, uh, you know, I've learned some hard lessons, I tell folks, you know, when I was a turnaround principal in Boston, uh, you know, at that, that time, it was under the one, I don't know if you remember, but it was under uh, President Obama, already got the four transformation, you know, things. And I remember I, would, I, I took that job, I was at the school called Boston English High School. It's the first public high school in the United States of America. And I'm walking into that job, not being people. They've already decided what model I had. And I had to give letters to get rid of people. Now, imagine I'm on the third day on the job as a school leader, and I got to do that. And then I'm telling you, oh, we're going to build community together. Those folks never trusted me. Right? So, you know, and but my job was to implement, right, and to follow through uh, what, what had to be done because the school had years of failure. Right? And so, uh, you know, so what I learned as I kept moving up is like how you approach and get people to work along with you, not only to see the vision, but what their role is in terms of what you're trying to get done is just as important as the strategy that you have itself. And, uh, and that has really played the important part. I feel like prepare me better for being in this seat uh, in the work. I mean, right now, for example, you know, although we're under COVID, we are now uh, going through the entire school system towards an industry-based model with early college. So next year, all of the ninth graders that are here in East Baton Rouge are going to be taking an, an AP course or dual enrollment course, uh, moving up the progression. And if it works out well, we will have a school system where by the time children become seniors, they either get either, uh, uh, everyone will at least have college credit uh, or have an industry-based certification uh, tied to something, and also every child here has been taking rigorous classes, right? and I've been working with that with our post-secondary institutions, which are at LSU, Southern University, and other partners, because I told them that they should be more involved in the K-12 structure uh, in terms of our design to close the gap between post-secondary and K-12, which has not been as heavy as it should in our system. And uh, this, you know, very exciting because, you know, it's the first time they've been this deeply involved in that space, but I told folks, you know, uh, we, I really see us more together in that work and less separated um, um, as our kids kind of go through this trajectory on, on what they want to do at that level. But, I, but I'll tell you the biggest gap that I've always had to try to close is trying to get people to see the same vision that you see and how do you get them to see that they're part of the work. Uh, not that they're a different entity of the work when you come in, that they, you know, they're not connected to that. And, and that's a very tricky space to do that. And I mean, we, uh, like I'm sure like any other districts, you have folks who've been in school districts for years and they, they come with history, right? I tell folks it's like history of baggage. You know, it's like, like my wife used to say to me, you know, yeah, I know you've been on a whole lot of dates before we got married, but like, let's make sure you clear your baggage before you come to this date, right? So, you know, but you know, it's the same kind of concept, you know, and, and trying to get people to see differently and innovate and push for access uh, for all kids is a hard thing, especially if they haven't been brought to the table or they haven't had an opportunity to partner with you in that way. And, and, and so that's, 
that to me is where the, 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 the gaps and challenges, I feel like I'm always working on trying to make sure that we move as we move the ball. So. Well, th th thanks for tying in the, the importance of, of local colleges, universities, and the business community. Uh, when Pedro Nagara was here for one of our uh, Q's uh, events, I think it was our second year, um, he said, you know, next to every low performing school district is a high performing college. And you think about that, that, um, and it's so true. And so, and, and often colleges with schools of education. And so you think about that, you think about the importance in the role that colleges can play. I'm fortunate. I am kind of sitting in the role between both of you. I have, uh, I report to University of Rochester, but I also report out to the school board. And so I get to live in kind of both worlds, but I'm lucky to have a university that has partnered and continues to elevate its partnership in ways that are supporting, not just the kids of, uh, at, at East, but our entire community. Uh, I'm gonna go to some of these questions and Justin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna transition over to you because your dissertation topic, and I know we talk about these things often on the weekends. The question I think from Andrea Cut was um, you know, what advice would you give to emerging uh, leaders of color? And then I'm going to also ask, I'm gonna add to that question and say, how should universities prepare um, and change its curricula to embrace and enhance the knowledge that, that, that leaders of color bring to the table? If I can answer the second question first, first of all, I, I just want to commend the university for having the urban studies, education studies uh, program, because a lot of universities, we're right next to Youngstown State, and that's something that I would love to be able to, to push a little more, because we don't have teachers of, co of color who go into the profession, and there's different, and then we do have the, them who graduate, and what, what normally happens in, in Youngstown is they come and they do their internship and they do everything with us, and then we don't see them anymore. And, and part of it is because they, they, they're, they're, they know what they will get into. And some of them, they don't have the ability to do it, or they don't have the patience to do it. So I think being able to have more classes that are directly related to urban schools and, and those different things that, that, we, that we do is, is, would be something that would be great for all of us. And I, the advice that I would give, and, and this is, I, I, it may be somebody here from my district, and they, if they're on, they will probably shake their head. Don't make fast decisions. You, you have to take your time to make decisions. You're going to always have community pressure. You're going to always, my dad used to say to me all the time, whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, somebody's always going to have something negative to say. So you should always make sure you take your time to, to make those right decisions. And then for young, uh, young emerging leader, I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday. Don't price yourself out the market. And what do I mean by that? We, I, have, I have a young man who I mentor and he's been teaching for four years and now he's working on his doctorate and he's still in the classroom. And I'm like, hey, take your time and get the experience to get the understanding because his mindset is, I'm gonna jump from being a, a classroom teacher to being in central office, but you, you need to have that experience along the way. And I think you also have to have, and, and I talk about this in our group all the time, and I'm probably more vocal than anybody else. We have to have the courage to make decisions that may cost us our jobs because it has, we have to do the right thing for kids. And people don't understand that at the end of the day, we can do whatever we want. We can please all the adults, but we don't get paid to please adults. We get paid to educate scholars, to educate kids. And we have to figure out what that is, what, what that is for those kids because there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all education. One of the things that's not in my bio, when I graduated from high school, I was reading at a third grade level. Now, I don't blame that on the school system, but I was a person who fell through the cracks. And because I was an athlete, I had the ability to kind of redeem myself but how many more people who are like me who never got to that point? And, and my goal has always been the same. When I was a classroom teacher, I never wanted somebody to leave my classroom the way that I left high school. When I was a, an administrator, I never wanted anybody to leave my building the way that I left. And when I became a superintendent, I never wanted a student to leave my district the way that I left. And that's, that's what drives me every day. And you have to remember, if I can give one lesson to that up and coming person, never forget your purpose. OK, because when, when other things fall and when people attack you, if you remember your purpose, you're going to be fine. But if you don't have it and it's not really in your heart, then you're probably not in the right profession. The hardest part of our job is not calling snow days for, for Sean, not for Cito, unfortunately. It's not calling that, it, but it's actually coaching people out of the profession. You think about that. We have difficulty telling people you're not good at this, but you may be good at something else. And that's part of our job as administrators. Thank you so much. That, that, that's, that's, that's deep. That's deep. And, and I said earlier, I, I really believe that many uh, leaders of color stay in urban settings, even though they're the most, some at times, the most under resourced and have the most systemic issues by design, right? Systemic by design, because we're trying to create systems that we ourselves deserved, but weren't able to have. And, and, I, and, and I know 
there's a great deal of burnout. And so I applaud, you know, Justin and Cito and, and, and I see others on the call as well who really do this work because they know their why, as, as Dr. J just put in the chat. I'm gonna add the next question is kind of a combination between um, uh, Kevin and, and, and Kristen. Um, they ask questions about, and it's for you, Cito, um, how we navigate state mandates and the changing state political ties with local interest and need in local context. The most current example of that is, is, is masking. In New York State, we're kind of tinkering on, are masks gonna leave um, you know, the school community? There was a big issue on a local school district last night with someone being um, pulled out um, of the board meeting for not wearing their mask. And it just continues to like cycle within New York State, I'm sure throughout the country, as the state kind of tinkers back and forth around how they want to um, exit this, um, this, 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 this current pandemic and try to adjust to a kind of life with COVID. How are you seeing that in Louisiana or what are you hearing from your national colleagues about their ability or inability to navigate these political dynamics while keeping the kids and our community um, as our priority? Yeah, well, when I talk to my colleagues, it's a mess. I mean, they, you know, depending on what state you're in. I mean, my colleagues are in Texas. It's just nightmare over there. I don't know if you notice how many superintendents are like, hey, I'm done with this. Right? Or if you go to some other states. I mean, it's a little bit different than others in some of the states. I mean, because um, the political navigation doesn't stop. Right? I mean, this, uh, it's just a different issue that you got to manage. Um, I don't believe that, you know, we should be in the business of, um, uh, you know, deciding on the medical, quite frankly, I, that, you know, you work with your health officials. So like, for example, here, what I did here in East Baton Rouge is I told folks, I'm not going to debate. I follow the science. I, I have the, the um, an epidemiologist and some of the top physicians from all of the hospitals in our community on a panel, which is our health advisory commission panel. And they, we look at data together and everything. And whatever they tell me that we should be doing, because they're the people taking care of us every day, I go do that. And, I, and yes, do I have some groups pissed off about it? Absolutely. Some groups excited about it? Absolutely. But I tell folks, at the end of the day, if they're the ones taking care of me when I got a heart attack, why am I going like, to listen to them taking care of me for everything else? And, and so it's just an interesting dichotomy right now on how our country has been. I mean, we, I mean, similar to, depending, I, I mean, I get an email every day about mask lifting and all that stuff. And, I, and I've told folks, you know, when the number gets this threshold, we will stop wearing masks. When we get this, I mean, it's as simple as that to me, but unfortunately it's gotten more political. Uh, it's not about, um, you know, it's not really about, you know, what numbers say in those days, it's about political opinions, right? And that has now gotten to the DNA fabric of what we're doing. And, and unfortunately now, you know, uh, you know, in certain states with my colleagues, you know, they have governors who are, you know, I call them making their bids, you know, in the process, which makes it even harder to kind of navigate. So, I mean, what's been good in my community, my community is a little bit mixed in terms of, I got majority minority kids, but I also have like some of the most influential folks in the system because they're politicians, kids in our school system and those things. So I'm, oh, I'm not getting too caught up in trying to balance, uh, you know, how they feel when I'm more trying to balance up, here's what we got to do. And also to say, here's what data I'm using, right? And so that's kind of how I've addressed with that issue. But what I find that has been harder to navigate, unfortunately, is you know people talk about the insurrection that happened in D.C. and those things. Well, I, what I've noticed is there's a shift that now these the fight of whatever issue we have is not happening at school board meetings. And when I talk to my colleagues, you know they they're saying, man, these folks are coming up in the school board. They're talking about all this other stuff, CRT or whatever the issue is. Now it's about mass, or and it, it, that's where the political dichotomy now is starting to happen. And, you have to kind of, uh, as a superintendent, you have to be kind of savvy a little bit to make sure that, you know, you keep the main thing, the main thing with the kids, but also be careful that you don't get into a political, uh, a, a confrontation, right? Because there's also, there's a reaction people are looking from you as a superintendent uh, to kind of manage some of these things. I mean, uh, it's gotten a little bit more hostile, I think, um, especially as we've gotten through this period. I know uh, different colleagues of mine are managing that differently. Um, I've been a little more fortunate here, um, uh, but but also I'm you know I'm up all night talking to people all day um, in terms of over communication. Um, I mean my days from 4 a.m. to I could be on one o'clock in the morning last night I'm on a phone call with a, a legislature. You know, hey, trying to clarify. You know, here's what we're doing. Here's, I mean. 
those are the things people don't see. Or I'm on the weekends. I mean, you know, I'm seven days working, trying to make sure that those things are happening. And, I, and at the same time, I'm asking my wife for forgiveness. You know, so, and I got to take some time for this. You know, and, and my daughter. So, but you know, it's it's just a part of what the work is. And um, you know, uh, I think it's very very hard hard work. Uh, and if you want to get it right, um, I think it just takes a lot of time. But it also takes a lot of partnerships building relationships, uh, you know, trying to get people to get around an issue. Um, right now, you know, in some communities, as I talk with some of my colleagues, equity is a dirty word, you know, so they're trying to figure out like, okay, I can't use that word. That's crazy. We can use that, you know, so now you have to define what that means for folks. I mean, we've gotten into a space, uh, quite frankly, where discourse has gotten so bad uh, and that now we have to like figure out how to get to the same thing and using different language to be explicit around how to get to that main point. Um, uh, but what's really, what, what I had to learn to navigate, you talk about you know, living in different cities, I've learned that you have to figure out what is the most simplistic language for that community to get to the end goal, right? So I don't get too caught up on like some of these other nuances. I get caught up in the outcome. And so my push all the time is like, okay, I mean, even with our team, we come in, all right, how do we make sure that our community understands this? Maybe if we say it this way, this is not something I understand, but how do we make sure this is what we get them to understand what they're saying? Or, or how do we have to go to different communities to do that? I mean, that's because different communities interpret things in different ways, right? Um, and, and so it's, it's trying to get them to just move in that direction to do that. And how do you do that in a way to also make sure that you're providing opportunity and access for everybody, right? Uh, the reality is the more um, the more um, diverse of a community that you live in, whether that's um, racially, socioeconomically, all those things, uh, there is a group that will always lose out or that has a resource that they don't have. They need to lose out might be the worst word, but and you have to close that gap while you're simultaneously making sure that other communities are accelerating. Because I, I tell folks, uh, an example I gave with somebody one time, I said, it's like you're going to uh, you're going to somebody's home and you maybe you have a party or something like that. And you have kids living, people on different floors. And, and what you want to do is you want to tear the roof of that house when you walk into the house and raise the floor. So everybody's getting an opportunity to be able to excel, no matter who they are, where they're from, and those things. And, and that's become much, much harder, I think, uh, under our current, um, um, our current space that we're in. Uh, and, and it takes a whole lot more strategizing, engagement, and those things more than anything. Uh, and so my, my, my attitude a lot has always been to tackle it head on, try the best you can to make sure that people know what your plan is. Mm -hmm. um, overstate that 400,000 times, you know, different social media platforms or whatever the communication mode that you use. And then making sure that the main thing is the main thing uh, and, and, and kind of work from there. All right. So, so thank you so much. Yes, I'm, I'm going I'm to ask you, let me ask you a couple of questions here. The first question I'm going to ask you is, is kind of an adaptation from Charlotte's question. So I was going to ask you something similar anyways. As we move into uh, 2022, 2023, and, um, and we, we know that there are students who and families who, um, who may need or have need, has needed additional social emotional learning and support, um, community outreach. We know that um, kids were learning in a different type of context. I, I hate when people say kids weren't learning for the last two years. They were learning. They just were learning in a different context. I mean, my kids learned more, tell me more about current events over the last two years and, than I knew about because they got it instantaneously on, on TikTok and places like that. Not always the most verified <laughs> data, but they gave me news to, to think about. Um, as you plan for, you know, continuation of school this year, really trying to hit the ground running this summer and then into next school year, what are some of the, your, your major priorities or maybe your top two priorities that you want to focus on? And what has COVID taught you about how to, how to move forward based on how the kids came back to us? And you're yeah. beautiful, man. I figured that. First and foremost, I got to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Davis, Joe, because we, uh, you know, my focus has always been mostly on literacy. But I think now our focus is more on having well-rounded students. So we, so we have a huge focus on mathematics and literacy because we, for so long, we, you know, that, that goal for the last 15 years, and I've been in the game for almost 25 years, that goal for the last 15 years have been, hey, let's raise literacy by, you know, 2018. That was back in 2000. And we're still, we're still where we're at. And what we created is, is a, a, a lot of kids who may be decent readers, but they know nothing about math. And we, and we haven't created that balance. So first and foremost is for us to create a balance. And, and the second thing for us is we really wanna spend the time developing our leaders and our building leaders. 
that's something that, that we we've been lacking during the pandemic because like our kids learn by by these this this is their you can't see this this is their everyday life this is cell phone so if we can't teach our kids with technology and have leaders who can help push our teachers to teach our kids with technology we're not going to move the way we need to move and and that's something we really really have to focus on and i don't mean putting the putting the kid in front of a computer and having somebody talking to him because that's no different from them being in the classroom but really using using the, the, that device as a resource. So that's something we really wanna push, but really looking at how we can help move, move them with not only literacy, but math as well. And when we think of literacy, people often think of reading, but literacy is reading, it's writing, and it's thinking, but it's also speaking. So if we, can, if we make sure that people know those are the four elements to literacy, it's not just picking up a book. It's not just reading comprehension. I think that, that's what we need in order to push people forward. But in order to do that, the research says we have to have not only strong teachers in the classroom, we have to have straight build, we have to have great building leaders, not great superintendents because we don't do the work. I think, Zito, you know, I, say, I say this all the time, the further we get away from the building, the less, the, the more important things are important to us, right? Because as, as a superintendent, we might as well be politicians. We're not going to get in the classroom. We're not going to be in the building every day to, to, to influence what's going on. So we have to rely on those people who we put in, in that place. But with that, we have to train them. They have to understand how to read the data. I, I was talking to my mentor last week, and we were talking about the evaluation. And I was talking about how you know some of my administrators struggle with the data. And the first thing she said to me was like, hold on, stop. You have people who are offering and they're doing evaluations and they can't do it and talk to the data to those individual people. And I'm thinking in my mind like, yeah, we, we, we and this is everybody we do. But but then I, I thought about the, the way that I work every day is I, re, I, reflect, I reflect on myself every day. What could I have done different? And you know what? I blame myself because I haven't spent the time to make sure that all of my administrators understand the data so they can speak to the data in order to move, in order to move the, the teaching and learning of our students and of our teachers. You muted. I figured that this is lessons in leadership, right? I mean, because I, again, I, I tell people that like um, that that superintendents are often leaders in a school context, but there's so much more to it. And, and, and Lorna's question, which I'm going to get to in a second, you can read it if you look at the chat. I think is really important. I want I want to hit on that for in a little bit too. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, but I do want to pull Dr. Davis onto the chat. Sorry, Joe. I know you were just being an observer, but but when I think about school leaders in the country, who are changing the game and focusing on math, particularly, and then STEM as a part of that, it's, it's Dr. Davis. So if you, I'm gonna give you 60 seconds of your own to say little or nothing, but, but, but tell me what, what, what are you doing on a national level, with local level first, but then what's the implications nationally around the importance of math? And, and this, the Warner School of Education is a huge proponent of, of math education. So you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here, but I wanna hear from you. Yeah, I don't know if I can do it in 60 seconds. <laughs> uh, thank you. you want, man. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sean, and everybody else. I, I didn't, uh, I'm always happy to be a part of the conversation. Uh, I'm Joe Davis. I'm superintendent here in Ferguson, Missouri, and been here since the Michael Brown incident. Um, but I'm a math teacher by training. Um, and I think that mathematics is the way in, right? Because if you look across this country, we have too few black doctors and scientists. Look at COVID, it's laid bare the disparities in terms of black folks in America getting access to high quality healthcare, uh, engineers, scientists, and so, so many other things. Forgive those uh, notifications, you all. Um, so, so math, I think, is at the foundation of building a better world uh, for all people, not just black kids and, and brown kids, but our white babies, our Asian children, all of them. It's inclusive. Um, my, our focus has been on getting students to AP calculus. So when people talk about math, that's my jam. Uh, I have a, you know, a, 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 a son who's a, a junior and he's in pre-calc, so he'll be in calc next year. Um, and so just getting him ready for that goes back to elementary school. And in elementary school, too few teachers uh, have the content knowledge to be able to teach mathematics well. Let me, let me say it this way. And most of you may be able to identify here when you when students get to middle school and I taught high school and middle school math. When students get to middle school, if they don't get in pre algebra and then eighth grade algebra, by the time they leave middle school, they don't get the AP calculus. But what's rooted in them getting uh, to that sort of, you know, track to cohort in middle school is elementary math. And if you look at third grade, which is where testing starts across this country and uh, teachers having the um, ability to teach math really well, reading literacy, as Justin said, they do it well. 
but math they struggle with. And often people say, well, I wasn't a good math student. It wasn't that you're not a good math student. You didn't have a great math teacher. So I think mathematics is the foundation and it starts in elementary school and teachers getting uh, you know, that, that, that preparation, teacher content knowledge, not just teacher efficacy, because that's really important. The expectations that I heard my brothers talk about a minute ago, but you've got to have the content. You can't shovel snow without a shovel, right? And so you really got to have the content to be able to teach that well and to make sure kids are ready for math when they get to middle school. So math is, I think, the civil rights era of this day, which is why we don't have more doctors, whatever color they may be, and more scientists going into those fields because we do a poor job as a country uh, focusing on mathematics. And that has been sort of my life's work is making sure that we make that a priority at our state capitals uh, and in Washington, D.C. if we're gonna have more children ready to do this work. Uh, so that's my sort of uh, elevator version. Hey, I had, to, I, I, I had to bring you on, man, because you flipped the whole Friday conversation a couple of weeks, a couple months ago about math. And we're all just sitting there taking notes and saying, you're right, you're right, you're right. You know, so so again, I, what, what I wanted to do today was to kind of bring this group into our living room, if you will, our virtual living room, our virtual living space. And these are the conversations that we have. It, it is part therapy, <laughs> but it is but it's also part content. And, and it's really about leadership principles and to sit and have a space and an audience that you can just sit for an hour and say nothing and learn a ton from is one of value. And we do that often. And so I think, you know, the three of you for logging in and I don't, I can't, I can't see the entire board, um, but I'm sure there are other folks who popped in and out also. But I wanna, I wanna end this on Lorna's um, uh, question. And thank you, Lorna. She, Lorna is a doctoral student um, candidate um, at Warner. So she is one of our own. Um, and she also did and helped the lead the transformation work at East, and now she's working with a local foundation that's supporting um, um, financially and structurally um, education initiatives within our community. So, so thank you, Lorna, for joining us, soon to be Dr. Washington. Um, her question is, is, is pretty impactful because we also talk about this. So, so be as real as you want with this one, right? Um, what we've seen throughout the pandemic, we often see it when there's civil unrest is you have additional pressure placed upon people of color to lead folks through whatever the mess is. In this particular case, throughout COVID and throughout some of the social unrest in the, in the country, there have been leaders who, have, who are now being highlighted for their talents who were often ignored prior to it. People are saying, oh, I didn't know they led like that. Oh, I didn't know they, were, they had that other a talent or skill. Oh, I had no idea that they had, they had that type of connection within the community. And the question that I have is what happens next to those individuals and how might organizations change how they recruit, how they're structured, how they support individuals who are now being recognized for their talents. I was speaking to someone this, this morning and I said, I love Black History Month, but I have a, that always puts a knot in my stomach when I hear this is the first astronaut or the first of this. Cause I hear it as they're the first person given a chance to do it. And how many people were denied that opportunity in the past? So every time I hear it first, I celebrate it, and then it puts a, a knot in my stomach because I think about how many folks were just denied the opportunity to to live their their wildest dreams. So, with that with that said, what happens now? How how might institu institutions restructure themselves to support this newly found talent? We used to call them the unicorns a couple of years ago. People said these, these are, we got we got to hire the unicorn. No, they're not unicorns. <laughs> They're out there, but they've been silenced. What do you do now as school leaders to like support these upcoming teachers, um, administrators? And then how do you um, promote school cultures that allow the, the newer generation to no longer be viewed as unicorns, but to be viewed as exceptional at, at whatever they attempt to do? So I know that's a loaded question. It's a lot there. Take a piece of it if you want. I'm going to go with uh, Cito to start, then I'm going to go to Justin, then I'm going to let you close out with a joke since I, since, I have, since I have you on today. Knowing that you being in Ferguson, you talk about political dynamics and leading through, through change, you probably have a, the toughest job in the country when it comes to managing an entire community um, through not just a pandemic, but through the social unrest that happened in this country. So um, 45 seconds or less, Cito, Justin, then we'll end with uh, Mr. Da Dr. Davis, and then we'll call this a wrap. we got four minutes. Cito? Yeah, so I just think like culture matters. I'll give you an example. I went to, I'm, uh, I went to Howard University's uh, superintendency program. The reason I went to there, uh, they were a combination of AASA, which is the state, um, the national superintendency program, because 
I knew after sitting in a bunch of seats that it was different to be a black male superintendent. Because what the dynamics that I deal with, people, when I walk in a room, as much as people say they don't see my color, they do, right? And I had to learn a little bit about what the actual issues were and also culturally how I can come across so people didn't feel threatened by me or they didn't feel a particular way about it. And so, you know, for me, when I was at the Howard program, they talked about that, right? And I've been in another program before and they didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about, you know, the high broad strokes. This is how you think about this and that. But all of those contexts matter. And I think what's interesting now to watch, you know, I'm similar to what Sean said and, you know, Joe and all of us, you know, we're fortunate to get here, but I tell folks it's, it's not really unintentional. Like there was some type of design for us that somewhere in our learning that whatever we interacted, uh, whether that was intentional or unintentional, it helped us to get through understanding what those experiential contexts were to help you know how to navigate in that space to be able to deal with all these ultra cultural dichotomies that our country has that really we, we know exist, but we don't talk about, right? And I mean, now this may sound crazy, but the woman that taught me a lot of this stuff was a white Italian lady <laughs> who was a product of Chicago public schools, right? Not a, it was a, she wasn't black, she was white Italian. She's like, you're a black male. Let me tell you how this thing's gonna go down. And like, and I was sitting there saying like, this lady's white and she's telling me this, right? But what was funny was she had for her, she was clear about, why black and Latinos and all of us weren't making it. And she talked to us. I can remember, write better, make sure you articulate like this, present your issue. I mean, nobody talked to me like that in terms of technical skills. And I wasn't offended about it because she created a space to say, this is something we believe is a challenge and a gap we gotta close, right? Now, everybody doesn't get that experience, right? I was fortunate, other colleagues of mine were fortunate in that process. But I think that schools and universities um, have to be honest with themselves around the cultural context and create design courses to address that, right? Uh, because these are things that we know that goes on because the better prepared that we are to deal with that, because you're going to deal with a whole lot of stuff in this city, whether you like it or not, it's better that you are to service an entire community. Because when you get to a, a job, you're servicing the entire community, whatever the makeup of that community is, whatever the socioeconomic structures and all that. But all those factors play a role in trying to move the ball forward for education for kids. And I think that it's important that uh, those elements are really, uh, that there should be a design for that. And also, I'll just say one last thing is uh, experiences for not only the conversations, but even ex having actual experiences for that, right? Because I got better and fortunate because I got to go to places where that was valued and they wanted me to learn, right? And I think that, uh, you know, there's so many more people. Um, I'll say one last thing and then I'll, I'll show yeah. you. Yep, this. 10 seconds. One last thing is, uh, to Joe's point, when you talk about intentional, in the, in the United States right now, if you look at doctors, right? Doctors that are black physicians in the United States come from three medical schools, 90% of them. Meharry, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, and Howard University. 90%. Now, if I broke it up by class, you'd even find it even more interesting because most middle-class Black families who understand that that's the pathway, they're not telling their kid to go to Harvard. They're not telling their kid to go to Yale Medical School. They're, black families are like, okay, go straight to, you're going to go to this school and you're going to go there because that's 90% you've got a chance to make it, right? And so it's an interesting thing that there's even in our current country setup around who gets to where you know, as you get educated, you begin to learn what that dichotomy is. And so it's, I just think these are the things that we have to really start putting in place. All right. All right. Justin. Uh, um, I, we're at a crossroads right now. We're at a powerful crossroads in our country. And, and I know people probably get offended by my term, but I, I use a term. I, I say that they, at, at, we're at a point where, where we can either go the way that we need to go or we can get Colin Kaepernick. And what, what I mean by that is the message that we want. Is, is not what people perceive. And, and that's what's starting to happen. We're being inundated by the critical race there. We're being inundated by these different things. But the fact of the matter, it goes back to the question is, we have leaders who can lead through this pandemic. And, and now I think that people are starting to see that it doesn't matter what color you are. But the power structure at B, they don't want that to happen because it's gonna go into a, a new direction. And I'm sharing something. We talked about this in the chat and I was in, in our conversation, we, we, right now, we're at a spot where we're worse than Jim Crow. And people don't realize that until, but it's a great spot because we have people who would never call out this bad behavior who are calling it out. But we, we can't lose that momentum in what we're doing, and especially when it comes to educating our kids. And I'll yield the rest of my time to, to uh, my frat brother. 
All right. <laughs> <We're rude. laughs> hey, listen, I think we have to sum it up. We have a hard time at this country talking about race, especially when it comes to black folks and white folks. Right. Period. And we need to have a better discourse about race. Um, we're different, um, but we're also alike. Um, and that's OK. Uh, but I think we have to have some tools to have the discussion in a thoughtful way uh, and to move forward. Every child uh, can be successful. Uh, but what happens in this country is that black children, black children in particular, don't get access to some of the uh, highest the AP courses and all of the rigorous courses that gets them to whatever college they want to go to. I had the good fortune of going to an HBCU, uh, predominantly a white institution and an Ivy League school. Uh, and I was well prepared in my undergrad HBCU experience. We have to make sure that we take responsibility, especially when you're in a position of authority, whatever color you are, you have a responsibility to make sure all children, each child gets educated well. I'll leave you with a quote that someone said, I forget who it was and I'd give them credit if I knew their names and I don't, but essentially what they said was, you know, especially if you're white, I wasn't, you weren't here when slavery happened, nor was I. Our forefathers were. Um, so, so the quote goes this way, it's not your fault, but it's your fight. That's for each of us, black, white, biracial, whatever your race, creed, or color is. It's not your fault, but it's your fight. And it's mine as well. And let's join together and get this work done. Our children are waiting on us. All right, all right. Well, I'm going to shout out my frat brothers too then. I see E. Rose and Charlie, Charlie Rock on the call. All right, that's, that's, a, that's a fraternity thing. You, yeah. <laughs> so, so I want to say, everyone, thank you. We are at the one o'clock mark, just like most Friday nights. We never end on time, nor do we start on time. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it's always a great time. So uh, I'll turn this back over to, to Doug or just to say goodbye or, or good night, good day. But thank you all so much for joining us. This is what Warner is all about. It's about bringing diverse thoughts and opinions to make us all grow and be ever better. So I thank you all for, uh, for sitting in the last hour and five minutes with us. And we hope that you join next week talk. Um, that that's, that should be equally exciting. I know Robert Hager is going to be on there and someone else, I'm drawing a blank. Um, but but make sure you um, you join in next week as well. Doug, good day? Good? All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.